Hello, hello, and welcome to my channel and podcast. I'm Dr. Judy. If you're new here, I'm a Christian physician and wellness expert. And on this channel, we discuss wellness, nutrition, faith, and mental health. And in this video, I will be discussing idolatry, the dangers of idolatry, what idolatry is, so that you can reflect on your own life and identify any possible hidden idols that you might have. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Of course, I don't worship idols. And you're probably thinking of the golden calf in the Bible, the Baal worship where they were bowing down to a golden calf. And you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, of course, I don't do that. But in my study of idolatry, I found that there are several modern idols and they're actually more common than you might think. My mom and I actually did a Bible study on this last month and it was so good. We got so much good feedback that I said, let me do a YouTube video sharing just the key points of that lesson. So let's get into it. So first, what does the Bible say about idolatry? Idolatry is a big deal for God. God hates idolatry. He is always calling his people away from worshiping other idols and to only worship him. When I think about how God feels about idolatry, it's similar to how you would feel if your spouse cheats on you. You will be devastated, right? You will be hurt. You will be heartbroken. And you might even get a divorce as a result of it. That's what idolatry is. It's basically cheating on God with another God or fake God, giving attention and adoration to something else other than the one and only God. That's what idolatry is. And I'll read you a few definitions that I found online. Tony Evans, who's a pastor, says an idol is a noun, any noun, person, place, thing, or thought that you look to as your source to meet your needs. And Miles Monroe has said that an idol is, or idolatry is to esteem with high value, to honor, to place highest value on something. And Webster Dictionary says, idolatry is the worship of idols or excessive devotion to or reverence for some person or thing. So think about what things people spend excessive amounts of devotion, reverence, or adoration to. Those are things that are possibly idols. So an idol is not just a golden image that you're literally bowing down to, but an idol is something that you're reverencing, that you give a lot of honor to, a lot of time to, and that you're depending on as a source to bring you joy, to bring you happiness, to bring you peace. God is the only thing that we should be idolizing, worshiping, and dedicating excessive amounts of time and dedication to. And in the Ten Commandments, the first Ten Commandment actually is about idolatry. And it's interesting that it's listed as the first Ten Commandment. And I'll read it. It says, Exodus 23 to 6, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And then it goes on to say, Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandment. And this is really important because God is basically here expressing that he has a zero tolerance policy for idolatry. It says, thou shalt have no other gods. It didn't say you can have a God sometimes, but it's like, no, you should have no other gods and you shall not serve them. So this is really important. And I think one of the struggles that mankind has is the struggle between worshiping the one true God who's in heaven and worshiping things that God created. So the struggle is between worshiping the creator versus worshiping the created beings. And some of the created beings that are commonly worshiped are your spouse, another person can be an idol, your pastor, any famous leader that you look up to and that you revere. And let's say they do something that's sinful and you're defending them and you get really upset if anyone says anything negative about them and you believe everything they say and don't fact check it with the Bible. That could be a sign that that person is an idol for you. So people can be idols. Material things can also be idols. This is a big one for a lot of people. Money, cars, clothes, status, all of these things can be idols. And a large portion of our modern society is dedicated to accumulating wealth, accumulating material goods at the expense of our soul 
and our relationship with God. Another common idol is yourself. So when I say yourself can be an idol, when you're constantly seeking pleasure, when you're seeking your own pleasure instead of pleasing God, that could be an indicator that you have made yourself an idol. For example, people that make decisions based upon their needs, their wants, what they want, what they think should happen, as opposed to making decisions solely based upon what the Bible says and what God has said, that person has made themselves an idol. Another example of a modern day idol is careers and social status, other people's opinions, right? Spending a lot of mental energy, thought, and time achieving status in society and placing a lot of your worth on your status, placing a lot of your worth on your career, your education, instead of getting your identity from the fact that you are a child of God and that does not change. No, it should not change. So these are some examples of modern idols. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, 24, that no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So this is really important because we cannot serve both. And oftentimes when people are going throughout life, I think they spend a lot of time and energy trying to obtain material things, placing a significant amount of value on the creative beings, as I mentioned, people, money, status, career. And what happens in place of that is that they don't give that same level of adoration and honor and even time to God. Oftentimes, the only time that people may spend on spiritual matters is on the weekend when they go to church. But during the week, they're too busy. They're too rushed to have time to spend even 15 minutes in the morning with God. They're rushed to work. They spend eight to 12 hours at a job that is not having anything to do necessarily directly with your relationship to God. Of course, you go to work and you are ministering to other people, but then you come home and then you're tired, you're exhausted, you're preparing dinner for the family. You don't even have a minute to sit down and catch your own breath. And then you realize it's nighttime and it's time to go to bed and you haven't spent even 15 minutes alone with God. And I want to challenge you to calculate how much time you spend alone with God during the week, specifically dedicated time, reading your Bible, prayer, not just like a quick prayer for your grace and asking God for safe protection when you're about to drive somewhere, but sitting down and spending time, carving out time in your schedule to pray, read your Bible, meditate on God's word, and then also to sit in stillness and allow God to speak to you. Calculate and tell you how much time you spend doing that during the week. Compare that to how much time you spend working. Now, obviously we have to work, but what I've realized and what God has shown me in the past year is that we have our priorities a little bit backwards. (laughs) We spend too much time at work, too much time being too busy, doing all the things, job, business, volunteer activities, family activities, doing so many things. When some of those things really could be cut back, And in place of that, we could spend that time with God. So that's just an idea, something to think about. And I want to share with you another scripture that talks about the importance of not putting material things, making idols out of money and other material things and things that are created. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And then in Matthew 19, 16 to 22, it tells the story of the rich young ruler who was unwilling to sell what he had to give it to the poor and to follow Jesus. He probably thought there's got to be an easier way to get to heaven that didn't require that much self-sacrifice. And also another modern idol that many might not be aware of is technology and social media. If you spend two hours watching TV, but can't find time to spend 30 minutes reading your Bible every day or praying, that's showing you where your priorities lie. And that means that your priority is not so much reading your Bible, praying and spending time with God, but it's watching TV, which is entertainment and seeking pleasure of self. But Matthew 6, 33 clearly says, but we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So I've just shared some modern idols. Hopefully that's caused you to think a bit and kind of reflect on idolatry in a way that's different than what you had not been before. Comment below, let me know what you think about the modern idols and the definition of idolatry. Let me know if you learned anything for that. 
I'd be really curious to know your thoughts. So now I want to shift and tie in worship and how important worship of God is and how worshiping God is almost a direct contrast to practicing idolatry. So what is worship? So worship in the Bible is meant to be directed solely towards God as passages in Matthew 4.10 says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. First Kings 9, God's instruction to Solomon was that if they worship other gods, Israel would be cut off from the land. And there are a lot of examples like this in the Old Testament where God gets really upset and his wrath is turned on towards the people for idolatry. God really, really hates idolatry. I'm so serious. It is a big deal. And then I wanted to share the Merriam-Webster definition of worship, which is to honor or show reverence for a divine being or supernatural power, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. So basically, worship means respect, full devotion, loving, honoring, and obeying someone who deserves our highest regard. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the constant struggles for mankind is we tend to want to worship the creation or the created things rather than the creator. And God is right now in this hour calling his people to abandon all idols and to turn back towards worshiping only him. And when you worship only him and you seek first the kingdom of God, your first priority, your list of priorities for your day is being obedient to the will of God listening and being in tune to his voice so that you know his direction for you, for your life, and even for that day. Other people's opinions become less important when you seek you first the kingdom of God and your primary concern is pleasing God and making him happy. You cannot please mankind and please God at the same time, most of the time, because human nature is very selfish and generally seeks self-pleasure and to get what they want or what an individual wants, which is the opposite of total and full surrender to God. So hopefully that explains how important worship is, how dangerous idolatry is. And I shared with you the example of a cheating spouse. That's really how idolatry feels like to God. It hurts his heart. It breaks his heart. And the consequences of idolatry are grave and devastating. So first, Idolatry impacts every single area of our lives. So the first one that I want to share about is separation from God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And to me, what this means is that practicing idolatry, which is a sin, separates us from God. And it can prevent our prayers from being answered. It can prevent God from blessing us. And it can have devastating consequences for our lives. And the next verse to share is Philippians 3, 18 to 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So that's the first point. Idolatry separates us from God. Just like how it's difficult to be intimate and to be close with the spouse After they've cheated, it takes a while to restore that broken relationship. It takes a while to restore that broken trust. That's what idolatry does to your relationship with God. And I always like to compare the relationship between us and God is like that between a spouse, between two spouses that are connected as one. And just like how nobody wants to be cheated on by their spouse, God does not want to be cheated on. He does not want you cheated on him worshiping other gods and worshiping other idols. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now the second consequence of idolatry is generational consequences. The sins of our ancestors, our grandparents, our great grandparents have consequences that affect future generations. Exodus 20 verse five says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. It's talking about idols. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And I've been reading and learning about generational curses and curses that are in the bloodline. And this is one example of that where sins from previous generations, possibly where they opened the door, opened the portal to demonic spirits or sins or idolatry has led to problems or issues that are passed down in the bloodline to future generations. This verse says, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So 
one thing that's important, if you're noticing a trend in your family of particularly something that n- seems to be repeated with multiple generations, let's say it's suicide attempts, or let's say it's having abortion or something else that's traumatic or bad, look at your bloodline and see, and maybe even talk to your grandparents, your great grandparents, if they're still around. And if you were able to try and get some more information about previous generations, those difficult conversations could be very revealing to you. So next I want to move to number three, the consequences of idolatry, loss of blessings. So there are several scriptures on this, but basically idolatry and idol worship is considered evil by God. It's breaking the first commandment. And in the Old Testament, when the Israelites turned from God to serve the idols of their neighbors, they were punished. Trouble was brought upon them. Afflictions were brought upon them and degeneration to their nation. And in Jonah 2 verse 8, it says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. And Psalm 16, 4 says, their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their sorrows, that means their sadness, their misery, their problems, their issues shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. I'm serious, guys. Idolatry is a huge deal. If you're going through life and you're seeing a pattern, maybe problems, I don't know. One thing to look at could be whether you have been practicing idolatry or whether there's been idol worship in your bloodline. These are things that people don't often talk about when they're talking about their problems, but our problems have multiple roots, which are often hidden beneath the surface. So the fourth consequence of idolatry is loss of inheritance, potentially. Ephesians 5, 5 says, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Yo, when I read that verse, when I was putting together this study, I was like, what? This is serious business. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, and it makes a distinction that that person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So they talk a lot in church about heaven. Are you saved? Oh, I want to make it to heaven. But you can be saved and then later turn against God and cheat on God with other idols and risk losing out on the kingdom, risk losing out on heaven, risk losing out on eternal life. And it's just not worth it. The things in this world are all temporary and they will all pass away. They're really not even important in the grand scheme of things. Getting money, getting degrees, getting big fancy houses, taking all these trips. All of these things really do not matter in the grand scheme of things. I am so serious. So think on that for a minute. So loss of inheritance and maybe read that verse and maybe read the verses before and afterwards. It's it's pretty deep. It's pretty deep. And I got convicted of this too, because as a physician, an idol for me was my career, my salary, my money, and the social status that it brought. And I no longer have that as an idol. God saw fit to take me through an experience whereby he led me away from that profession. However, I can remember how a lot of my time, a lot of my days was spent on my career, on the profession of medicine. So even myself got checked, right? I'm not sharing this video just to say I never struggle with idolatry. I'm sharing a personal example of myself. So hopefully this kind of It's not too hard for you to bear and listen to that you really just pray, reflect, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. As you're listening to this, maybe listen to it again and just prayerfully consider the message that I'm sharing here because I would truly hate for you to miss out on heaven, the kingdom of God, especially if you spent so much of your life going to church every week, you serve in ministries, you're kind, generally speaking, but you have modern day idols. Or you're cheating on God. So that's why I'm sharing this video because it's really important. And at the heart of it, although I'm a physician, I'm into wellness and for many years talked exclusively encouraging people to eat more plant-based food. Now my primary focus is on bringing people into a deeper relationship with God, helping people that are believers to go closer in their relationship with God and to go deeper beyond a surface level relationship with God. So that's really what I want first and foremost. My primary concern is your soul and your salvation. And I had an epiphany where God showed me this during the pandemic 
that if people eat healthy, obey all the healthy lifestyle pillars, they eat a plant heavy diet, they exercise, they get their sleep, they don't smoke, they don't drink alcohol, but they don't know God or they're lukewarm Christian. And then they get to the end of life and they die and they don't really know God and they end up not making it to heaven. They've missed the whole point of life. The point of this life, I think of it like a simulation for what's to come after this life. And our single purpose and focus must be to obey the will of God and to do what he tells us to do. That's it. So if you don't get anything out of this video, and if you're still like, oh, I don't think idolatry is that big of a deal, reflect on this verse, Ephesians 5.5, 5, and then go back and read the Ten Commandments. I personally think it's listed first for a reason. Okay. Now, so the fifth consequence of idolatry is eternal separation from God. This is so serious. Revelation 21, 8 says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. I don't want that. What about you? <laughs> I don't want that. Eternal separation from God. And I don't know why more pastors are not talking about this. I don't know why more people are not talking about this, but this has been something that has been heavy on my heart and my spirit to share for a couple of weeks now. And I just feel God saying, call my people back to me. Mankind is basically acting like a whore right now. <laughs> Mankind, the body of Christ is acting like a cheating spouse. We're cheating on God. We're sleeping around with other idols. And that's the best analogy that I can give because I think it will give an emotional re reaction when you think about it and think how serious it is. You just you think if you've ever been cheated on, how painful that feels and how angry you are with the person, how you don't even want to see them. You don't even want to speak to them and it's so difficult for you to forgive them. That is how hurt and disappointed and angry God is when we give adoration, honor, reverence, excessive amounts of time to anything else but him. Okay. So we've talked about idolatry, what it is, what modern idols are, the consequences of it. So now I want to move to how do we overcome idolatry and how do we deepen our worship of God? So the first thing is that every generation has a choice to seek God first. And this decision is crucial. It's crucial. And when we practice idolatry, we compromise our relationship with God. And we're adding sorrow to our lives, basically. And this is evident in these days in the world. This generation right now, what we have is a generation that is self-centered, that is seeking to please self, that has made self an idol. The Bible has given us clear instructions and clear guidance of how we should behave, how we should manage ourselves. And it's even given us guidelines for relationships sexual relationships, who we should be having relationships with and who we should not be having relationships with. And mankind now is saying you can have sex with whoever you want, man and man, woman and woman. It doesn't matter. That is idolatry. That is one form of idolatry, making yourself an idol, making sex an idol, making self-pleasure an idol. And God is not happy with it. God is like, you people, what are you doing down there? And we just need to repent. We need to repent. First, we need to acknowledge that there's a problem. Acknowledge that there is a problem. Reflect and see, okay, am I making my career an idol? Am I spending so much time at work, making more money that I don't need, right? Trying to keep up with the Joneses and take all these luxurious trips, buy these name brand bags and all this stuff. And I'm not spending that much time with my family and I'm hardly ever spending any time with God. So first we have to acknowledge that, confess our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is forgiving. He's loving. So we confess our sins. He will forgive us. The second thing is we must renew our mind. We must put on the mind of Christ and not the mind of this world. The mind of this world is wicked and selfish and deceitful, as I mentioned. Okay. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. The next thing about how to overcome idolatry and deepen our worship of God is we must seek God's kingdom first above all things. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And Mark 12, 29 and 30 says, The first of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. So what does this mean? When we worship God with all our heart, our soul, and all our mind, that means that God is at the forefront of our decisions. That means that we don't make decisions like I'm going to apply for a job and then pray to God that we get the job. We don't decide that we're going to date this person because they look like a good partner and then ask God to co-sign it and say, God, please let this relationship work. No, when you serve and honor God and love God with all your heart, soul, and your mind, before you even think to make a decision, you're getting on your knees and you're praying to God. You might fast and pray about it. You're like, God, I met this person. I think they might be a nice boyfriend for me or a nice partner for me, nice husband, something like that. What do you think about it? Before you even start dating, you're asking these questions. This is what full surrender looks like. Before you even apply for the job, before you even choose a career, you're like, God, you created me. You know why you put me on this earth. Show me what your will is for my life. What skills have you given me? And how do you want me to use them to further your kingdom and to glorify you? That's it. That's what that verse looks like in practicality. And I think a lot of times you read scripture and people don't translate it to our modern society and where we are. So that's why I like to give examples that you can relate to and you can be like, oh, that's what that looks like. And like for me, like for example, like I went to medical school because God spoke to me when I was in my early 20s and told me that that was what he wanted me to do. He told me exactly why. He told me how long... I- he told me that I wasn't going to be practicing forever. I'm just not sharing this because now it seems like it's manifested, but he said, I'm not going to be practicing forever. And he told me exactly what I'm going to be doing and what skills and gifts he gave me and how he wanted me to use them. So that's an example of full surrender to God with even the choice of your career and degree. And how I have been able to really hear God's voice super clearly is that I spent a lot of time alone with God. And I think that's one of the blessings of being single. And then also, honestly, having a family that's not super close and connected. You know, I don't have like cousins, aunts, grandparents, and things like that, that the family is getting together regularly. It's really just my immediate family. And the immediate family is fractured and kind of separated. So I don't have a lot of outside voices chipping in and telling me what to do and filling my mind with their opinions. <laughs> so I guess that opened up my space and my heart for God to speak to me from a young age. So anyway, I just want to share that example. So next, I'm going to wrap up, I'm going to wrap up this video. <laughs> I just wanted to share how you can strengthen your worship of God. And this is something that God also has laid heavily on my heart in the past year. And I've significantly changed my lifestyle. We need to spend more time in prayer and Bible reading, especially right now with where we are in history. I believe that we are in the last days. Satan and his army are out in full force right now. They are aggressively seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. They are aggressively seeking to deceive the body of Christ. And they are seeking, God, Satan is seeking to come between our relationship with God and separate us from God. And one thing that you can do to tighten the bond between you and God is spending more time in prayer and Bible reading. There are so many examples in the Bible, in the New Testament, where Jesus woke up early in the morning before sunrise to go off by himself in a solitary place, not at the synagogue, not at church, not with the disciples, by himself to pray. And he would be there for hours, hours. And I think to myself, my goodness, if the son of God is spending this much time in solitude and prayer, how much more time shall we who are sinful beings here on this earth in this time right now where the world is so wicked, how much more time should we be spending in prayer every single day? Luke 6, 12 says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And people will have all night prayer vigils when someone dies or when there's a mass shooting, when there's something tragic, people have all night prayer vigils, but we should be having prayer vigils on a regular basis. We should be praying and spending, I would say at the minimum, Ideally, I think 30 minutes every day. When I started spending at least 15 minutes every day and now 30 minutes with God, 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening, it changed my life. I'm more grounded. I'm more centered. I feel calm all the time. No matter what happens, I don't feel stressed. I feel this inner peace and joy that nobody can take away. And 
you will find that you will make better decisions as a mom, as a father, at work, in your career. You will make so much better decisions when you spend more time every single day with God. So that's the challenge from this video. So the call to action or the take home point from this video is reflect on your life and see if there are areas where you are practicing idolatry and is there anything that you've made an idol out of? Understand that it makes God very unhappy, but there is forgiveness. So all you have to do is repent and acknowledge and seek God's kingdom first. Pray and ask God how you can become closer to him. And one thing that you can do to become closer to God is spend more time in prayer and Bible reading every single day. It's not enough just to go to church on the weekends at all, especially with where we are right now in Earth's history. So that's all that I wanted to share with you for today. Hopefully this was insightful and led you to think a little bit deeper than the surface. I know it was a lot of information. Watch it again, share it with someone, like this video, subscribe to the channel. It really helps us to grow and comment below what you thought about this video. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks for watching.